With earlier dynamic problems apparently resolved, and all other systems working extremely well, Lockheed officials hoped that the production contract for the Cheyenne would be reinstated. But it would not prove to be that easy. Several unrelated issues had been gaining momentum and would ultimately coincide to bring an end to the program. First, a debate apparently emerged over the difference between the roles and missions of the Army and those of the US Air Force. Opponents of the Cheyenne argued that one of the helicopter's primary missions, close air support for ground troops, was a responsibility that had traditionally been assigned to the Air Force. In fact, the Air Force had initiated a design competition of its own for a new close support aircraft at about the same time that the first Cheyenne rolled off the assembly line. A prototype of the new aircraft was expected to fly in early 1972, and procurement plans for more than 700 production models were in the works. Many who participated in the Cheyenne's development believe that its high-speed ground attack capabilities threatened the very existence of the Air Force's program, thus creating considerable opposition to the project from the very beginning. As the roles and missions dispute evolved, another situation arose that would have a tremendous impact on the fate of the Cheyenne. In 1969, Bell Helicopter convinced the Army to buy a thousand models of a new attack helicopter, the Huey Cobra, as an interim solution for the ongoing conflict in Vietnam. The Cobra was a modified version of the original Huey and was considerably less capable than the Cheyenne in many respects, most notably speed. But it was a simple, affordable and reliable option that could pack quite a punch. In fact, as a result of the relative success of the Cobra in Vietnam, the Army apparently redefined its requirements for a new attack helicopter. High speed was no longer an issue, but survivability was. The new aircraft would only have to reach a top speed of roughly 185 miles per hour, but it would have to be equipped with two engines as opposed to the single engine that drove the Cheyenne. When Lockheed heard of the new requirements, it proposed a twin-engine propellerless version of the Cheyenne. But there were other problems that were hampering further continuation of the program. For one thing, Lockheed's projected cost for each aircraft had risen from $1.5 million in 1966 to well over three million in 1971. The Cheyenne already appeared doomed when a final incident took place that ultimately sealed its fate. During a crucial meeting with government officials to determine if the program would continue to receive funding, a pair of tow missiles were fired to demonstrate the system's phenomenal accuracy. Dozens of tow firings had been conducted without a single glitch. But this time would be different. The first missile fired drove straight into the desert, missing its target completely. After the demonstration, Lockheed officials desperately tried to explain that the tow missile had a failure rate as high as 10% and that they had never had a failure before. But it would do little to remedy the situation. On August the 9th, 1972, the Cheyenne development contract was officially terminated. While the missile failure alone did not kill the project, it is clear to many who worked on the Cheyenne that it provided the final excuse for those who opposed its ultimate success.